Okay, good afternoon, welcome back. They gave me 45 minutes this time, not five minutes, which is nice. I think it's 45 minutes. So uh, this first session of the afternoon, uh, we're gonna be talking about two important investment areas for AWS and two areas that are becoming increasingly important for customers that are looking to use the cloud, actually in a broad variety of different ways, often focused around changing the way in which they interact or identify customers but also extending into a very broad uh, set of use cases for deep learning and neural network technology. So that's gonna be the focus for this session. Uh, we did say that this was primarily a non-technical event. I'm probably gonna ignore some of that guidance for this session, okay, as you might expect me to. So uh, machine learning, it's not new technology. Uh, the principles upon which modern machine learning systems, deep learning neural network systems were bu are built were uncovered in the 1960s actually with the first uh, description of the perceptotron, and then uh, early research into uh, pattern detection, anomaly detection, and pattern matching uh, using neural network, ne network technology. The challenge is that it was difficult in the early days to turn the research into practical products that could address real use cases. Uh, and the challenge came from these areas, actually. Uh, it was difficult to assemble enough data to train the models. It was difficult to access enough compute resource to execute the computational operations that were required to execute that model training process. And then in performing inference, so using the developed models to make decisions, uh, that was a costly process. It was viable because the computational overhead is much lower, lower in that case but it was a costly process. And also increasingly, uh, our use cases have been identified for machine learning, and maybe the classic example of this is in things like autonomous vehicles, where actually the usage of the models needs to take place out at the edge of the network on mobile devices. There could be large mobile devices like vehicles or mobile devices like the uh, smartphones that we all carry in our pockets today. Again, if you look back at the early uh, research into uh, machine learning, deep learning systems, these devices didn't exist, so those use cases couldn't be, couldn't be practi practically fulfilled. What's happened over the course of the last, well, several years, is a few factors have started to coalesce, uh, and the coalescence of those factors has led to the emergence of solutions for these challenges, okay? The first thing is around data. Uh, where do we keep our data at scale? Have you ever heard of the phrase data gravity, which talks about the difficulty of moving large data sets around? And it's that concept which leads to the truism, the reality really, that if you're creating a large data set today that you wanna make use of for applications, either analytics applications or neural network training applications, it's much better to bring the compute to the data than it is to take the, take the data out to the computing resources. And this is the reason for the emergence of the phrase or term data lake and the reality that if you're creating large bodies of data today, the natural place to store that data so that you can later process it in a variety of ways is in the cloud. Okay? It means that your data is in a location where its gravity is something you can take advantage of by bringing all of your compute tasks periodically to the location in the network where the data happens to be stored. So you bring the processing to the data rather than the other way around. Second thing is uh, on training. Training is a high performance, short term compute job that you're gonna run against the large data set using in most cases, special purpose computational resources. And these are interesting in themselves in the fact uh, that the gamers in the room will already have these devices sitting in their house, okay, hidden inside their rigs, as we like to call them, which are, of course, the high-performance PCs that we all have in our uh, homes for playing video games on. They've got GPUs in them. Uh, the GPUs are mass-scale parallel computing devices that can perform thousands or tens of thousands of computational operations in parallel, so simple operations like floating point or integer arithmetic is what these devices are built for, and they're built for doing that at massive parallel scale. And that's exactly the same thing that you need to do in performing statistical analysis on neural networks. So GPUs plus data 
equals the capability to train a large scale model and to train and update a large scale model at speed means you don't just need a few pipelines. You need tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands or millions of floating point pipelines available to you. Where can you access that for an hour or two hours in a simple way without having a lot of capex, without having data centers full of heat generating uh, GPU infrastructure? Well, you can access it in the cloud. Okay, so we have machines that are specifically designed with GPU capacity in them. You can run them against data sets and you can use those to build uh, train models that you later use for inference. Inference is similar, but it's much more uh, continuous in its computational demand and it's much lower in terms of the peak requirement for computation that you're gonna have there. So you can use either GPUs or you can use regular CPUs. And you might want to do that on demand. You might want to run your inference model as and when you have a piece of data that you want to make a prediction about or a piece of data that you want to assess using a model that you've trained. And that's where this idea of serverless computing comes in and the idea that you might just run your, your inference engine as an on-demand API operation. So you call an API and say, you know, is this document a tax form, for example? And the computational effort to work out whether it is a tax form or another document takes place in an ephemeral chunk of computational capacity, which is then discarded when that particular task has been completed. That's serverless inference, okay? And then lastly, uh, deploying this stuff out to the edge. So on mobile, on IoT, uh, also on powerful hardware. Uh, the Tesla, for example, is equipped with its own high-performance GPU infrastructure that enables it to detect white lines, pedestrians, and other vehicles using the cameras that are mounted on the vehicle. And there's a pretty powerful supercomputer inside each car that is manufactured. Okay, so edge devices can go all the way from one of these right the way up to a vehicle that has its own NVIDIA or AMD GPU infrastructure within it. Okay. The issue there really is about fleet management in the sense of managing a large number of endpoints, also deployment, uh, and how you manage things like security credentials uh, for access to uh, the devices themselves, which might, of course, be safety-critical devices in the case of vehicles and industrial equipment. You have to have the right trust model, the right threat assessment, and the right management infrastructure to control and manage those devices in a secure way. Again, something that the cloud, with its strong cryptography, uh, its identity management features, actually very, very well suited to provide solutions for. So this has led to AWS becoming a very, very popular location for customers of all types to run these workloads. Okay, and I'm gonna talk about a, a few of these uh, by way of example now. So this is a really interesting example. This is Stanford University Medical School. Okay, this is uh, a retinal image, so the back of somebody's eye taken with a specialist imaging device. And it turns out there's a correlation between features appearing in retinal imaging scans and in the worsening of diabetic complications. Okay, and it also turns out that there's a large data set of scans that have been taken of healthy and unhealthy patients and historical data about those patients having gone on to develop or not develop a worsening in diabetic symptoms, diabetic complication symptoms. And what Stanford have been able to do with AWS and with uh, the use of deep learning frameworks on top of our technology is build a system that is able to detect the correlation between the images and the worsening of symptoms in a way that exceeds the capability of a human doctor. Okay, so the neural network is more effective at determining whether a diabetic patient is going to suffer a worsening in complications from a retinal image than a trained human being with 10 to 15 years of medical experience in that specific field is. Okay, so better than human systems uh, built using AWS, in this case for medical diagnosis. This one's a little bit more consumer. So this uses TensorFlow, which is an open source deep learning framework that simplifies the process of training models and of making inferences from existing trained models, often put to work in imaging, but also put to work in text classification, feature extraction, and other uh, similar workloads. And what you're seeing here is the system that powers the in image search on Pinterest, okay? So if you were to jump onto Pinterest or receive a selection of images that Pinterest think 
might match your interests or match other images that you've previously looked at using their surveys, the intelligence that associates tags with images is not human. Okay? The intelligence that associates tags with images is an image classification system built using a TensorFlow abstracted deep learning neural network which runs on the AWS platform. Okay, so if you search for, this one I did quite recently, minimal tattoos, okay? So tattoo style involves writing on the, on the arm normally. You're getting hundreds of images back that are all visually similar, but no human being has ever looked at the majority of those images. There was a classification activity that took place sometime in the past, but now the classification is driven by machines. It's driven by a neural network, which will draw inferences about the similarity between different images, tag them appropriately, insert those tags into a metadata search system, and allow you to do image search on systems that have never been looked at by anybody employed by or working for Pinterest. Okay, so that's a pretty interesting system. Obviously, the primary challenge here is high scale, very, very, very high scale. They have millions of images. They have millions and millions and millions of users. Uh, and it's a very, very popular app, a very, very popular web property. So doing this at scale, at the scale that is required with a, a workforce would be extremely expensive and extremely difficult to manage. And then lastly, uh, on edge devices. This is a Chinese company that's headquartered close to Shanghai called Too Simple. They provide uh, firmware for other manufacturers that are building autonomous vehicles, okay? And what you're looking at here is something called real-time planar detection, okay? So a neural network is being used to pick out the flat plane of the road surface, which is one-third of the three-factor autonomous vehicle driving system which is visually based, okay? The other two thirds are object detection. So this is a person, this is a vehicle, uh, this is a road sign, this is a lamppost, and uh, depth of field heat map. So how far away is that person? How far away is that road sign? How far away is that pedestrian crossing? Those three factors can be combined together to deliver real-time hazard avoidance, okay? So I know what I can drive on, I know what objects are in the scene, and I know how high the priority is for avoidance based on how close they are to me and how rapidly they're approaching. Okay, and you factor those three things together, deploy them down into a vehicle, and you can build an autonomous driving system. The interesting thing here is that the model, of course, is trained in AWS, and then it's deployed out into special purpose hardware, GPU-based special purpose hardware, which is deployed in the physical vehicles, together with camera systems, and the inference takes place not in the cloud, because of course, it's not great to have a safety critical autonomous vehicle that requires a permanent internet connection. Uh, the inference takes place out on the vehicle. It can make its own local hazard detection, its own local safety decisions without uh, connectivity or intervention from anything external to the physical device, which in this case would be the, would be the autonomous vehicle itself. Okay, so three good examples. Now, we ourselves at Amazon, as you might have heard this morning, with our own uh, autonomous flight systems in Prime Air and in many, many other uh, situations around the broader Amazon.com companies, we put machine learning to work every day. Did you know, for example, that before a package is dispatched to you from an Amazon fulfillment center, a camera will look at the items that have been picked for dispatch and a neural network will verify that they match the items that you ordered? Okay. So we're doing our order accuracy checking using deep learning systems. And if there is a high percentage chance that there is a mismatch, a human being will be introduced into the loop to visually verify that you have the right things in the right quantity in the box that goes out to you. This is one of the reasons that it's very unusual for individuals, you and me, customers of Amazon, to receive the wrong stuff. And they've got a very, very high order accuracy rate by using this kind of technology as a verification step inside a manual process. Okay, and this idea of hybrid machine human intelligence, it's very, very common. Okay, so uh, it's very common to use a neural net, to use a deep learning system to flag, uh, to flag uh, activities where you require manual intervention. That could be a chatbot where you don't have an automatic 
solution to fulfill for a particular intent that a customer has requested, or it could be in logistics in the way that I've just described, where if you have high confidence, you do nothing and allow the dispatch to run ahead as planned. If you have confidence that is lower and you feel there might be the wrong product in that, in that box to dispatch, then you can inject a human into the system, verify a very, very efficient way of making sure that human intelligence is applied where it needs to be. So in doing our work in ML and AI at AWS, uh, we actually think about creating solutions at several different levels, okay? And the idea here is to provide solutions that have relevance for many different types of developer, okay? You've got developers that operate at the high level, that operate at the highly abstracted entry point into the service. All they wanna do is generate speech or have the capability to call out the features in an image or maybe build a conversational interface in the form of a chatbot. They don't wanna know or think about platforms, never mind frameworks or infrastructure. Okay, they just wanna operate at the highest level of abstraction and their requirement is expressed in terms of, I'd like to verify whether this face matches one of these 10 faces that I have in this pool. Okay, so very, very high level uh, developer-centric, use case-centric requirements. Second thing you've got is people that are building services like that but don't want to deal with the heavy lifting associated with establishing clusters, running jobs, dealing with data ingest, either for training or for inference, or orchestrating, scheduling the large fleets of compute resources that might be required for these periodic training operations that need to be run. In this case, you can consider these platform components abstraction layers that make it easier to do those things, easier to marshal large volumes of compute resources, easier to perform basic machine learning operations like uh, regression analysis to figure out what the next most likely number in a sequence is, or binary analysis to figure out what the next most likely value for a missing variable might be in a data set. That's the sort of technology that is used for things like recommendation engines on Amazon or Netflix, by the way. So that's uh, our Amazon ML service or deal with things like high volume data ingest where we have our, our Kinesis service to fulfill that. So they're all about simplification of operating the broader ecosystem that is required to build these kinds of apps. Underneath that, uh, you've got ML engines, okay? And if you're not into machine learning, a lot of this won't mean much to you. Uh, but MXNet, TensorFlow, Cafe2, Theano, PyTorch, and CMTK, they are tools that software developers will use to abstract away the complexity of building and operating different types and different parts of the workflow that is required to build ML systems, okay? So I can have my uh, computational convoluted deep learning neural network. I can write all of the scaffolding required to build that in a programming language of my choice. It'll take me tens of thousands of lines of C, hundreds or thousands of lines of Python, okay? Uh, or I can use something like TensorFlow or Apache MXNet, establish a few objects within my scope in Python, and all of the heavy lifting associated with building the underlying data structures to support the neural network, well, they're hidden away from me, they're abstracted away from me behind the classes that are provided by the framework. So it makes it much simpler to build uh, deep learning systems with the same level of control, but without the same level of pre-work, without building everything yourself all the way down to the data structures that are required, okay? So that's the role that these engines play. And then underneath that, you've got AWS primitive building blocks, so high-performance computing resources with masses and masses of GPUs, high-performance general-purpose compute, IoT for managing edge devices, or mobile SDKs for managing the process of getting data down onto mobile handsets to form part of the applications that you might wanna build in that context where you're putting deep learning or ML features into mobile apps. That, by the way, is not that uncommon, believe it or not. You might think it is, but it's actually not that uncommon to do that. So that's our, our stack. Uh, I'm gonna talk about a few of these in a little bit more detail, uh, focusing principally on uh, one of the frameworks, Apache M MXNet, and some of the underlying components that we can provide to make AWS a really good place to run both that and other deep learning frameworks like TensorFlow. And then we're also gonna talk about these three high level services which are at the very top level of the stack and make it incredibly simple for developers and product builders to incorporate deep learning features into applications that they wanna build. First thing we're gonna focus on is Poly. So this is a service that you will have heard 
in action if you use uh, the Amazon Echo. Okay, so if you speak to the Amazon Echo, what does it do? Well, it talks back. Okay, and the speech that comes back to you is not generated on the device. Okay, that will be impractical, uh, very expensive, and the device would need to be extremely large. Okay, the device would also need to be flashed every few days or hours as new features get added to the service. We'd need to push new speech down onto that. Instead, we use a decoupled speech engine, and we provide a very similar decoupled speech engine for customers to take advantage of directly, which is called Amazon Poly. You send it text or a special purpose markup language called SSML, speech synthesis markup language, and we send back to you rendered audio in the form of MP3 files or in the form of a real-time audio stream, which you can play directly out of the device, and you can obviously hear, okay? 48 voices. 24 languages, so substantially more than the Amazon Echo supports today. It's low latency and real time, so you will get a hear and feel, rather than a look and feel, a hear and feel, <laughs> which is very similar to the experience that you get with the Echo. You send the text, and sub-second, you will have the voice come back to you, either in the form of an MP3 file, or in the first bytes of the stream that you want, okay? And this can be used, obviously, to build speech functionality into devices, into applications, or incorporate it into workflows that you might need in order to build other products or other services. So how about things like, uh, well, this is a real use case, Royal National Institute for the Blind here in the UK, they perform audio transcription of the written word so that visually impaired people can access content, newspapers, magazines, and books, okay? For a long time, it was completely uneconomical to perform that task for anything other than long-lived content. So you couldn't get a magazine or a newspaper that was accessible to you if you were visually impaired. It was uneconomical to render it into audio. Now they can perform that operation as an on-demand task. So the first time that somebody comes along and wants to read a copy of, I don't know, what's the most niche magazine that you can think of? There's one in my local news agents called Earth Mover Weekly. No joke? Okay. So the first time somebody comes along and wants to read that or hear that, there's a real-time capability for them to transcode the text into audio and stream it down directly to the individual so they're not locked out of accessing content just because the content is infrequently accessed and therefore may not have been economically viable to have a human being read and record. This is a really important service for that excluded community of people with that specific disability enabled by, by Amazon Poly as a platform component. I'm sure you can think of a lot of other things you could put that to work for in your business as well. We use it in another service as well that I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. Recognition, so this is uh, image search, classification, and concept, face detection, and facial analysis. Okay, so you give it an image, and it will give you back a set of entity types uh, with probabilities. This is real, so I sent this image last night, and this is what I got back. So beach, coast, outdoors, sea, water, palm tree, plant tree, island, land, landscape, niche, scenery. There's an important nuance, objects and concepts. So there's no uh, object there of a landscape, okay? But there is a landscape visual concept. Like there's an outdoors visual concept that is present in that scene. It's not an actual item that you can put a box around in the picture, right? But it's definitely there. And that's a really important aspect of this service. If you're gonna think about image tagging, metadata extraction, it's as important to be able to detect, detect scene level concepts as it is to be able to detect, detect specific objects within the scene. Okay? And again, this is a very, very quick process. What you have, we have, of course, is a pre-trained neural network in the back end. You send your encoded image to an API endpoint. We apply that against the model that we've built using our training algorithm, and then we send you back a data structure that contains the results of that request. Okay? It's also pretty smart with human faces, sentiment analysis, uh, are you smiling? Are you happy? Are you male? Are you female? Uh, many, many other attributes. You can also use it for landmark detection on the face. Uh, where are the eyes? Where are the corners of the mouth? And, and others, bounding boxes, other stuff like that, which can enable automated image manipulation. Maybe anonymization of images uh, where you want to obscure facial features. It's trivial to do that with the service once you put a, a bounding box around, around the face. So there are many, many different use cases for this. The other thing we have is facial search, verification, visual similarity search. Okay, so you can, in fact, we've got a proof of concept 
which has been built by one of our solutions architects, walk up to an air airline counter at an airport, be recognized from a passenger manifest, and be greeted and be partially checked in on the basis of your visual ID. So you don't have to speak to the uh, agent. By the time you get to the agent, they already have your details in front of them. All they ask for is your passport to verify, and that's it. So it speeds the checkup process and could, in some cases, reduce the amount of personnel that are required to manage manage processes like that. You can think about many different applications in hospitality where you might consider using a system like that. And then lastly, uh, on this high-level abstracted set of services, something around conversational access to applications. And again, this is very similar to the technology that is deployed within the Amazon Echo. And one of the hardest things to do here is something called intent resolution. Have you ever considered how many ways it's possible to ask for exactly the same thing in English. I'd like to book a flight. I'd like to book a flight from London to New York. I need to fly from L London to New York. Next Thursday, I need to fly from London to New York, and I prefer Delta, and, and so on. There are literally hundreds of thousands of different ways that I can construct a sentence with the same intent and very similar meaning. Okay? And here we put the neural network to work to do two things. The first is to extract these intents. So that would resolve down to the book flight intent. So I want to book a flight. That's what I want to do. Okay. Uh, in order to fulfill that intent or execute the transaction associated with whatever I'm asking for, I need particular data. Okay. We call these uh, pieces of data slots. Okay. So destination, origin, date of travel, preferred airline, class of travel, could all be slots that are relevant to this particular intent. Uh, and we use the deep learning network on the outbound to generate the questions. You know, I need to fly from London to New York. Well, I'd obviously want to ask, when do you want to travel? Do you have a preferred airline? What is your preferred class of travel? The neural network generates the questions dynamically. I don't need to write them. I don't need to create uh, 1,001 different cases in my switch statement to evaluate what's being asked for and work through all of the potential permutations of response that are required to fill out the missing components in the data model. Everything is handled by, by Amazon Lex. Now, you can uh, build a lot of additional logic here using uh, what we call fulfillment functions, which are custom pieces of software that sit behind the conversational bot and enable you to interact with it in custom ways or enable you to design custom interaction flows which will guide your customers, guide your employees through using this system to fulfill whatever use case you have in mind. Okay, some really good examples of this already out there. One of them is Liberty Mutual. They're a global insurance company headquartered in Boston in the US with a very substantial development presence in both the Republic of Ireland and in Belfast as well. And they were one of the early adopters for this service, creating an intelligent knowledge management and search system for their employees that would allow their employees to ask questions like, uh, what are my pension contributions each month? Or where can I find out more information about my medical insurance plan? Okay, so it's employee self-service, converting common transactions that would take place with their employee help desk into something that was made available on their intranet via the existing chat tools that they already use within their enterprise. Okay, so identifying what those common intents are, codifying them, connecting them to information sources within the enterprise, and making that a self-service interface enabled by natural language. We have a really nice feature here, which is an intent waterfall. So those intents that are not fulfilled will end up in a set of analytics that you can see. Okay, and that can be a useful way to build the backlog of additional functionality that you want to add to your chatbot after you've done your first phase release. I actually really like that feature. Uh, this is a service that I've used myself, so you can talk to me, sort of. Disclosure, actually talk to my bot. Go here, facebook.com, ian.massingham.aws, send me a message. Amazon Lex will reply to you. Uh, this system at the moment supports uh, feedback and ratings about these talks, okay? But I'll accept any feedback via the system. It also uses sentiment analysis to score what you say to me and tell me whether you're being kind or not. Okay, so check the system out. It's a live, uh, live tool uh, built using this service. 
So uh, those are our three high-level abstracted services, Amazon Poly, Amazon Recognition, and Amazon Lex. They actually have common features, so built-on neural networks, lots of built-in functionality. They're integrated with other AWS services. Uh, they're all intended for production use cases today. They're all available today, uh, and they all have free-tier operation operations, so you can experiment with these services at no cost. So check them out, give them a shot. Uh, what about building and running your own custom deep learning applications on AWS? So this is a, can I have a little bit more light in here, just for a second, so I can just see a little bit more of the audience, that's cool. So who here has got any experience with neural networks or with deep learning in practice, where they've actually used a system of this type? Okay, hardly anybody, that's pretty much what I expected. So the first thing we need is a quick deep learning 101, okay? So the way that these systems work is using these low-level constructs called perceptrons, which are thought to be similar to the way in which the human brain operates, okay? And we're using a subsampling technique here. So this is from a paper, actually quite an old paper, about handwriting digit recognition. Everybody that put their hand up about neural networks has probably done this exercise, because this is like the hello world for neural network developers. There's a large tagged data set out there of handwritten digits, one through zero, okay, which are very simple images. And pretty much every deep learning framework tutorial, every uh, deep learning 101 computer science uh, curriculum class lesson will include working with this data set. Okay? And what you will do is take your images, which you can see here is a 60 mile an hour sign in this case, wire them up through feature maps, and then over here, put them through uh, what we call a convolutional neural network. The convolutional neural network operates on the values that are present in the matrix represented by the image. Okay, so we're simply looking at the numbers that are present in this square image. Each one of those pixels is represented by a series of digits, right, which define brightness in the case of the grayscale image, or maybe RGB or bigger numbers in the case of a color image. Okay? We'll wire that up into our complex network, and we'll just look at the values of the different pixels within the image. And we'll feed that through a number of different layers which are in turn wired to one another. So layer two is calculated from a function of the values in layer one. And layer three is calculated from a function of the values in layer two, and layer four from layer three, and layer five from layer four, and so on down the stack. At the end of the stack, we're gonna collect values which are far removed from the input image, okay? And we're going to correlate the values at the bottom of the network against the features of the image. And through some magic, that's going to allow us to train the system so that when we put another image in and we see what values are produced by running it through the same network, we can assess what they match. Okay, so when we talk about feature detection or feature matching, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about how mathematically close the output values are for the sample image, for the target image, against the output values for the large collection of samples that we've run. Okay, and then we make a probability assessment, which allows us to determine whether the sign says 60 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour, or 30 miles an hour. Okay? The larger the training set, the more accurate, more accurate that we can be. And so it's simple in concept hard to build at scale, and hard to operate. The reason it's hard to operate is that's a tiny little 32 by 32 image, okay? What if that was 16 million pixels okay, that we were feeding into our network? We'd have a very wide array at the first level, okay? And then we'd have a stack of other sets of data that were calculated from that input level, okay? And actually, to get really good at this, uh, this is something called ImageNet, by the way. To get really good at this, you need you, know, you need deep networks, okay? So uh, in 2016, the most effective classifier in this competition for image cl classification used a neural network with 269 layers. Okay, so we've got 269 derived sets of numbers that come from our wide input array. Uh, that is a lot of maths. It's a huge amount of maths in training, and it's still a large amount of maths in, uh, in inference, okay? The blue line, by the way, is accuracy. Okay, so you see in 2010, the classification algorithm that we're using here for this question, so are these two dogs the same breed? Do you think they're the same breed? Who thinks they are? 
who doesn't think they are. Okay, you lot are all wrong, and the first lot are all right, so they are the same breed. So uh, <laughs> the accuracy in answering this question improved over that period from 28.2% errors down to 3% errors, and humans are, as I've just illustrated, not that good at this. The machine is actually better. The machine is more effective at determining image matches. Okay, and actually, there's a lot of other concepts that this particular system is very effective at detecting within images as well. Objects, scene level concepts of the type that we talked about earlier on when we were talking about recognition. Uh, find out more by visiting that URL at the bottom of the screen. But the point I'm trying to make here is you need massive amounts of calculational power to build these models. You need a large, substantial amount of power to perform inference to actually run new images through the model. Okay. So what do we have? Uh, let's throw that away. We have machines that can perform 125 trillion floating point calculations per second per system. Okay, so they're very fast and actually very cost efficient in performing the training operations that are required to build the models that are later then used, used for inference. This is a brand new launch that we just made this last week called the Amazon EC2 P3 instance type. It includes a hardware component from NVIDIA uh, called the Volta. The NVIDIA Volta, which is a very, very high performance uh, floating point unit. Way, way more powerful than you can ever use in a use case like video rendering. You know, they just have far, far too much performance for, for that. You'd never find a screen with enough pixels to keep them busy. Okay, but for large scale deep, neural, deep learning neural network training and inference, they are a really good system, a really cost efficient system, and a really high performance system. These are brand new. The other thing that we do is focus on providing uh, tools at the framework layer that make the use of the common abstractions that are prevalent within this field very efficient uh, and also produce content in our own right which is intended to make this technology accessible to developers that want to build with it. Okay, So just a few examples of that. We have something called the AWS Deep Learning Army. An army is an Amazon machine image. It's a prepackaged software build that you can quickly and easy de easily deploy onto computing resources within our EC2 platform. So typically when you launch a new instance, you'll select an army, an Amazon machine image, and a few minutes later, all of the software that's bundled within that army will be available on a running machine for you to use. Okay, they come in all kinds of different flavors from basic things like Amazon Linux or Ubuntu through to uh, versions of Microsoft Windows that have Microsoft SQL Server packaged within them. There are thousands of them available in a marketplace that we provide as well called the AWS Marketplace, some of which we contribute, some of which are contributed by third parties and partners, some of which are just contributed by altruistic AWS customers that have a passion for a particular type of software and want to spread that by making it easy for other customers to use. We also maintain some of our own, which are not operating systems, but are intended for specific use cases. And this is one, the Amazon AWS Deep Learning Army. Okay, so we're packaging in here the frameworks, MXNet, TensorFlow, Cafe2, Theano, and the other tools that I've talked about already. That makes it easy for developers to abstract the complexity of building and operating the networks and makes it really simple for them to start training and incorporate those trained models into applications that they're building. Below those frameworks, there is a set of drivers. Programmers in the room might have realized that when I was talking about MXNet and TensorFlow before, I was talking about Python, right, which is a high-level interpreted language. But what I want to do with that Python is massive amounts of floating point calculations, which is probably something you would normally solve by writing in C, right? You want to do a lot of maths quickly. You don't want an interpreter in the way. You want the most performance efficient mechanism for accessing your hardware, which is not going to be writing code in Python. So what's in the middle between the framework and the hardware? Well, there's something called a CUDA layer there, which is a set of drivers that abstract the GPU hardware, make it available to a C framework, and then provide a consistent API for higher level abstractions to be built upon. And that's CUDA, okay, the CUDA uh, framework. We bundle that with this uh, army as well. So the complexity of setting that up is also removed from developers that want to build on this system. This was the release announcement actually saying that we'd updated all of the software components to work with this new P3 instance family, which came out 
I think a day after we announced the new hardware. So we're very quickly able to take advantage of that and run your neural networks more quickly and in a more cost efficient way as well. Second thing we've got on here is our announcement of Gluon. Uh, this is another library uh, for machine learning. Again, the same kind of thing as one of these other frameworks that a machine learning developer might put to work in order to simplify the process of building optimized neural network components and then incorporating them into their apps. It's something we're collaborating on Microsoft, uh, with Microsoft on. And then lastly, just an example of uh, trying to make the technology more accessible for developers with illustrations of use cases. This is something called neural machine translation models. Uh, this is, uh, you know, I say hello, but French people say bonjour. It's probably a terrible accent. Uh, but the, the process, that, that is, I mean, quite obviously, that is a job that you could use a neural network for, because what have you got? You've got large corpuses of translated material. I've got a huge number of works that have been written in English and translated to French, German, Italian, Spanish, South Korean, and hundreds of other languages by professionals over the last 200, 300, 400 years. So what can I use that for? I've got a large data set which has features within it. What can I use it for? I can train a model. So I can pump in my own English sentences or French sentences and have the neural network translate them to another language on a probability-based model using ML, which is trained on human data, on precursor translations that have been performed by linguists, by language experts around the world. And this blog post explains how to do that. It explains how to build and train your own neural machine translation system using a uh, open source project that we have, uh, which is a framework called Sockeye that's designed specifically for that kind of use case. And that's something that the majority of people in this room with a technical background will be able to walk through and recreate, in, uh, in my opinion. So that's all I have. To learn more about this stuff, go here, awsamazon.com slash AI. It's a huge area of investment and focus for Amazon, this particular domain. And we obviously have, you might have heard already earlier in the day, AWS reInvent coming up at the end of this month now in Las Vegas, the very last week of November, and the first couple of days of December. I'll be fired and probably shot if I reveal what we're going to announce at AWS reInvent. So I'm not going to do that, but I will say that there will be a lot of new announcements and new services that add to some of the services and features that we've already covered in this session. So you should definitely check back in on awsamazon.com slash AI in the first week of December uh, and see what's new, because there's gonna be a lot of new, uh, new features there that will, will make it even easier for developers to incorporate these kinds of features into applications that they're building. Thank you. Clock says I have 90 seconds for questions. So does anybody have any questions they want to ask? No? Okay, I'll say thank you. Talk to my bot if you want to uh, provide any feedback. Thank you.